This week, we are reviewing Robert Heinlein's classic Starship Troopers, a book full of militarism that touches on the morality of violence, citizenship, and war. These are five things you will love about Starship Troopers. Before we begin, be sure to hit subscribe and click on the notification bell for more great book reviews. I'm author and writer Scott Seeger, and I love books that have something to say beyond just the story world they pretend to be about. Science fiction is the most metaphorical of genres. It's never about what it's about, but always an allegory representing something else. And good sci-fi is never about the future. It's always about the world we live in today. But first, let's get something you'll love about this book out of the way. Number one, it's not the movie. Yes, this is the book that was made into an extremely violent film for children. The movie left out all the interesting parts of the book and greatly expanded on the mundane battle scenes with giant insects. The director, Paul Verhoeven, who made other sci-fi movies like Total Recall, Hollow Man, Robocop, and also Basic Instinct, said this of the book. I stopped reading after two chapters because it was so boring. It really is quite a bad book. I asked Ed Neumeyer to tell me the story because I just couldn't read the thing. It's a very right-wing book. But then he went on to make a disposable shooting gallery which spawned four awful sequels. Yes, there are five Starship Trooper movies out there. There is very little action in the book, so Verhoeven pumped up the action scenes and satirized the parts he didn't understand. Infantry, sir. Good for you. Mobile infantry made me the man I am today. The point is, under no circumstances should you back off from this book because you think it's going to be like the movie. It's not an action-adventure book. There's one battle scene in the beginning and one in the end. Everything between is about Juan Rico's experience joining the military, going through basic training, and his entrance into officer candidate school. Also, the book is not satire. It takes its subject matter quite seriously. And although the plot line of a recruit going through basic isn't particularly original, the concepts this recruit is exposed to are Juan Rico learns of citizenship, punishment, violence, and proportionality of destruction. Surprisingly, there is one theme missing that is common to war stories told from the soldier's point of view, and that's brotherhood. Starship Troopers focuses on cosmic issues and the common theme of brotherhood is absent, which is refreshingly welcome as that concept has been overdone. A few of the themes Juan Rico learns about they bomb the enemy just enough. There is a concept in war known as proportionality, where you bomb the enemy, but just enough. Not too little, but also don't go overboard. For example, it's been argued that the bombing of Dresden during World War II by the Allies was over the top. Historians have said that it was not militarily significant to warrant wiping out the entire city, and it's also been argued that the Germans firing of V-2 rockets into London's population centers was a direct response to the Dresden firebombing. A good example of how not following proportionality doctrine can come back to haunt you. In the Starship Troopers universe, this concept is talked about by ship's sergeant Jalel before his men are launched in heavily armed, mechanized suits. This is just a raid, not a battle. It's a demonstration of firepower and frightfulness. Our mission is to let the enemy know that we could have destroyed their city, but didn't. But that they aren't safe, even though we refrain from total bombing. I don't want to see any of you loafers back aboard here with unexpended bombs. Get me? The troopers of Starship Troopers are armed with just enough bombs to cause the exact amount of chaos the military brass has decided. No more, no less. And there is a strange logic to this as Sergeant Zim explains the purpose of violence in basic training. There can be circumstances when it's just as foolish to hit an enemy city with an H-bomb as it would be to spank a baby with an axe. War is not violence and killing, plain and simple. War is controlled violence, for a purpose. The purpose is never to kill the enemy just to be killing him, but to make him do what you want him to do. Much of the themes the troops learn come from their formal education and basic training, and readers have praised this as the book's strength. Number three. The History and Moral Philosophy class. In the world of Starship Troopers, they make it difficult to join the service. Dropping out is easy. The concept of going AWOL seems to be encouraged as they don't want soldiers to be soldiers who don't want to be soldiers. Basic training requires cadets to take a course called History and Moral Philosophy, and we get some interesting debates and lectures from the teacher who challenges his students on long-held beliefs. When a student declares that violence never settled anything and refers to the destruction of the ancient city of Carthage and its people as an example, the teacher, Mr. Dubois, swiftly responds. Once you say that violence had settled their destinies rather thoroughly, he continues by saying, I would advise to conjure up the ghosts of Napoleon Bonaparte and the Duke of Wellington and let them debate it. The ghost of Hitler could referee, and the jury might well be the dodo, the great auk, and the passenger pigeon. Violence, naked force, has settled more issues in history than any other factor, and the contrary opinion is wishful thinking at its worst. 
Breeds that forget this basic truth have always paid for it with their lives and freedoms. Most soldier stories have them rush through basic training and sent into battle not knowing how they got there. Starship Troopers gives us something better as the discussions in the history and moral philosophy class brings the book to another level. We are drawn into the Starship Troopers universe by this government that requires its recruits to understand the philosophical concepts of war as opposed to just shoving them into the front lines. Another compelling class discussion around the book's midpoint deals with juvenile delinquency and how it spiraled out of control in the mid-20th century. This addresses the fears, or maybe predictions, of mass crime waves that were prevalent at the time and argues that pulling corporal punishment out of the schools led to this. This reflects a debate that was taking place in America at the time about the decline in our moral code among young people. The book was released in 1959. Was Robert Heinlein unreasonable in his concerns of juvenile delinquency and mass crime waves? This brings us to number four, another aspect that is sure to pique your curiosity. Citizens earn their right to vote upon military discharge. In Starship Troopers, only veterans are allowed to vote. You must serve to earn your right to vote. Some have argued that this particular aspect makes Heinlein's novel fascist. According to Wikipedia, scholar Jeffrey Cass has referred to the setting of the book as unremittingly grim fascism, and Jasper Goss referred to it as crypto-fascist. I've never heard of either of these guys, but they're both in academia. When a college professor calls something fascist, you best stay away from it. So don't read the book, it'll turn you into a fascist. I'm not even sure what the definition of fascism is anymore, but based on my observations on social media, it means someone disagrees with someone else. But we only see the Starship Troopers universe from the military perspective. For all we know, the other aspects of their society are democratic and we have no reason to think it's an Orwellian nightmare. If you were an alien visiting Earth and you rented Full Metal Jacket, you may too think we're a fascist society based on observing just that one example. For a better analysis of Starship Troopers and fascism, check out Seagull Gatherer's great video on the subject. The link is in the description. But back to our philosophy classes, the teachers of Starship Troopers have more compelling opinions. This was the tragic fallacy which brought on the decadence and collapse of the democracies of the 20th century. Those noble experiments failed because people had been led to believe that they could simply vote for whatever they wanted and get it, without toil, without sweat, without tears. Another professor explains why only those who serve can vote. Under our system, every voter and office holder is a man who has demonstrated through voluntary and difficult service that he places the welfare of the group above personal advantage. He says man, but women also serve in the Starship Troopers universe, so we assume that women can vote too, and he was using man as a shorthand for mankind. It is an interesting concept to only allow those who demonstrate altruism to vote. Our forefathers put a system of checks and balances together because they knew altruism was a farce. This was based on centuries of European monarchies and the forefathers had the idea that instead of relying on a single monarch to do the right thing, we just assume our leaders will serve their own greedy desires and so they built a system of competing self-interests. Also, one could argue that military service amounts to a poll tax, which Americans have always argued is discriminatory. And of course, a major flaw is Highland's assumption that veterans always have the good of the many at heart. The fifth element that I enjoyed in the book, and I think you will too, is the character of the father. The father caught me off guard. Juan Rico's father only has two scenes in the book, but they are both memorable ones. The father's not afraid to give his opinion on the military when his son informs him he's signed up. Parasitism, pure and simple. A functionless organ, utterly obsolete, living off the taxpayer. A decidedly expensive way for inferior people who otherwise would be unemployed to live at the public expense for a term of years, and then give themselves heirs for the rest of their lives. Yes, he's talking about the military there. But in a later chapter, the father shows up very unexpectedly to both Rico and the reader. Without giving away, the father made a choice and he explains that his moral reasoning had to do with his son's decision to join the service. It turns out he's reconsidered his earlier comments on the military and understands his son's decision to fight. Their reunion and reconciliation brought me to tears. Back when this book was written, it was unheard of for a father to sit down with his son and admit he was wrong and that the son was correct. I imagine a teenage boy reading this section during the 60s and having an equally emotional reaction based on his own relationship with his father. This book was written for teenage boys, but it's surprisingly adult with its themes of morality, citizenship, and the nature of war. Even though it was written in 1959 at the height of the Cold War, and the communal society of the enemy bugs are easily a metaphor for communism, the book is still relevant today. It's a bold read and worth your time, but just remember to steer clear of the movie. And I loved reading the reviews on Amazon for this book. They have a certain nostalgia. Here's a pretty compelling and sincere one. I first read this book years ago as a child, and in many ways it shaped my entire worldview. 
It quite literally changed my life. I recently retired after 27 years of naval service, and as silly as it may seem to some, this book was the foundation of my success in military service, in the lives of countless young sailors, and in my new role as a civilian. That's high praise, and if you scroll around in the reviews, you're going to see more of them like it. So please, leave some comments below about how this book affected your perception of war and violence and your reaction when you first picked it up. That's it for this week. Make sure to hit subscribe and check out my own book, Grand Portage, about a man dragging an aircraft carrier across northern Minnesota. It's available on Amazon in Kindle and paperback. Click on the link below in the description and never stop reading.